Hi, this is Elliot Fishman, and we're on the YouTube Live. It's the 13th of April. It's the last day of Passover. I hope everybody is doing well. Outside in Baltimore, it's in the 80s. On Saturday, it was in the 30s. So, And last Friday was in the 80s as well. So it's been a crazy spring. The flowers are blooming. Um, the bugs are flying. Everything is good today. Hope you're doing well as well. And today's topic is the esophagus. And Lily reminded me that this is Esophageal Cancer Month. So we'll speak a little bit about the esophagus. And what also helps is there was an article just published literally yesterday by Javad Azadi, one of our great junior faculty. This was published in Current Problems in Diagnostic Radiology. And it's on the CT evaluation of the esophagus, the role of CT imaging and CT imaging findings in diagnosing esophageal abnormalities. What perfect timing. And the good news for all of you, this is published by Elsevier, I think. And what Elsevier does is uh, they give the authors a link for 50 days where you could post the article or people can uh, sign in to see the article for free for 50 days. It came about three days ago, so you have 47 days left. If you look at our Facebook page for a couple from a couple of days ago, you'll see the link to it, or we'll, pu we'll put it up again today. It's worthwhile to look at, download, take a look at, whatever else you want to do. But it's a nice article reviewing the esophagus. Now, in radiology, the esophagus has been around for a long time, right? Fluoroscopy was a key study for looking at the esophagus. And in fact, it still is. We had people who made their career, Bronwyn Jones, who used to be at Hopkins, is a good example, swallowing difficulties, which are becoming even more important with an older population. So we do swallowing. The thing about fluoroscopy, it's a dynamic study. You can see how people swallow. You can see if they aspirate. You can get a good look at motility of the esophagus. It's a very dynamic study and still a very commonly used, the biggest challenge is, is that none of us know how to do fluoroscopy anymore. At Hopkins, we have some excellent RAs, radiologic assistants, and the future really of things like fluoroscopy and swallowing is these RAs. They're worth their weight in gold. Don't tell them I said that or they'll ask me for a raise, but they really know how to do the fluoro. They're like old-fashioned fluoroscopists. Not only do they know how to do it, but um, they enjoy doing it and do it really well. They take really good care of our patients. The person who does it in, in diagnostic at Hopkins down in the basement is Amy. And Amy, unfortunately, is leaving us at the end of July and moving to Texas. And whoever is in Texas, wherever she looks for a job, boy, you guys will think you won the lottery. So... And we're looking for someone. So if you're listening to this and you want to come to Hopkins and be an RA and work with some amazing radiologists, this is your moment. Okay. Anyway, CT, however, plays a major role in looking at the esophagus. If you think about CT, we look at the esophagus almost every body scan. On the chest CT, we almost see the entire esophagus. On an abdominal only, we see part of the esophagus. And in a chest abdomen, we see the entire esophagus. Now, we do get specific studies requesting esophageal evaluation, sometimes trauma, sometimes perforation, sometimes uh, suspected esophagitis, sometimes aspiration, foreign body like a fishbone or a battery or a piece of steak. We uh, will also look in patients with GI bleeding. We look at the lower esophagus, especially because patients with cirrhosis have large varices, and this could be the cause of the patient's uh, uh, GI bleed. Now, one thing in looking at the esophagus, it's much better with IV contrast because we can tell enhancement. You can really get a better look at wall thickening. Uh, if you want to look for a leak, fistula, positive contrast, something like a iohexol diluted, kind of exactly what you do with a swallowing study, you use that. The way to do it, of course, perhaps, is when the patient lays flat on the table, then have them drink. Otherwise, it usually doesn't um, stay in the esophagus unless there's obstruction. Of course, you want to be careful when you give a fluid to someone laying down. 
that they're not going to aspirate. So it's a little bit of a challenge in that direction, but it's something that we need to do. And that becomes very, very, very important. Now, in terms of esophageal pathology, we could think of congenital things. So duplication cysts. We could think of Zenker's diverticulum, big outpouchings, upper esophagus that can lead to aspiration, can simulate a mass or simulate perforation. We could think about things that are a result of therapy. Esophagitis uh, can be due to patients on different medications, can be due to patients who've swallowed caustic agents, can be due to patients with reflux. We talk about a markedly dilated esophagus. It could be a distal tumor. It's a possibility. It could be scleroderma, but then you're going to see changes in the lower lung fields with interstitial changes at the basis, classic for scleroderma. You can see a markedly dilated esophagus with lots of food and fluid uh, and the transition at the level of the GE junction with no mass present there, and that's going to be achalasia. Achalasia, increased incidence of esophageal and uh, and tracheal cancer, achalasia aspiration, achalasia massively dilated esophagus can lead to aspiration. We know that. So uh, sometimes patients present with widened mediastinum. You think there's a mass or the section and you find a dilated esophagus, massively dilated with about a week's worth of food in there. And then you kind of know that, hey, I'm dealing with a uh, achalasia. So very, very important. In terms of protocols I mentioned, if you want to look for a fistula, you want to look for perforation, you want to look at the esophagus, positive contrast is ideal in that regard. You can use neutral contrast like water, but it's a little bit trickier. As again, as I mentioned, uh, positive, con positive IV contrast, using IV contrast is good, particularly for bleeding. It's good for varices. It's also good for looking at tumors and extent of tumors. Um, CT is good for looking at the presence of adenopathy. Again, the depth of penetration, unless you see a fistula, it's hard really to judge that on a CT scan. We look for complications, patients who've been intubated, tracheal injury or esophageal injury. We look for patients who've had procedures post endoscopy. We worry about perforation, looking for that. We've also seen patients with ablation, like left atrial ablation procedures, particularly early on in the studies, the ablation was a bit too posterior where the esophagus sat and patients had esophageal injuries, including perforation of the esophagus. So it's something you need to be very much aware of. I mentioned duplication cysts. Sometimes it's hard to tell an esophageal duplication cyst from a uh, bronchogenic cyst from a mediastinal cyst, but usually you can. We talk about tumors. I mentioned esophageal cancer. But you also can see occasional lymphoma. You can see big, big bulky masses, which are just tumors. I showed a case in conference the other day of a low-grade Lyomire sarcoma. Those are exceedingly, exceedingly rare. But it's something at least we should mention, particularly if you see an eccentric lesion, which you're not really sure arises from the esophagus. It's often eccentric, and so it makes it easy. We talk about foreign matter. So fish bones, people eat those big bass or codfish, they can get a big fish bone. We talk about someone who ate steak, who has a motility disorder, you have a, a fatty mass in the esophagus obstructing distally. We talk about kids swallowing objects like coins or even batteries. If you're doing a, a foreign body, don't give any oral or IV contrast at first, do a non-contrast because things like batteries obviously are very dense. Things like fish bones are less dense right? So you really would like to see that very thin, very opaque fishbone. And we have a few nice examples in the article. So you can take a look at that. And the steak is really a nice one because the steak, usually it's a big bulky steak and it looks like it's a lot of fat in that steak. And the patient has this dysmotility and there's a mass. Uh, we talk about, I mentioned diverticulum like zankers. Don't confuse that with a perforation or with an abscess. We talk about dilated esophagus and aspiration. You look at the esophagus, look at the lung fields. Remember I mentioned scleroderma, achalasia, big esophagus, often with aspiration pneumonia, or patients with aspiration in general can get pneumonia. So that's not gonna be uncommon. I mentioned about varices, lower esophageal varices can cause bleeding. 
Remember that with esophageal varices, if you only have arterial phase imaging, you may miss the varices because you'll see multiple masses and you'll say, oh, these are nodes or something else. If you want to look at the varices, you need venous phase imaging. We've seen many times people call bulky adenopathy must be a tumor of the lower esophagus and it's only varices. Very nice examples. You can go to our website, go to, to our teaching file, lots of good esophageal cases, spectrum of disease, really, really nicely showing you a range of processes. We also will look at the esophagus in relationship to the stomach, hiatal hernias. At times, you can have a big hiatal hernia, which can lead to a gastric volvulus, and the esophagus is really part of that volvulus, so that can indeed be very important. Obviously, as we stage patients with esophageal cancer, which is how we got into this discussion, you want to, you'll be looking at the liver. You want to look for nodes by the celiac axis, the periaortic and peripancreatic region. You want to look at the spleen, but especially look at the liver. You want to make certain the patient doesn't have metastasis any place distally. So that uh, is a very good way of thinking about things. And I think that covers everything. That's 11 minutes and 11 seconds, I think, of what uh, stuff you would like to look at. Uh, a few comments. I see a few people say hi, and we say hi back. And Lily did list the article, which you can go look at. I think it's a really good read, really good pictures for you, for your techs, for the residents, the fellows, the faculty, whoever wants to learn about the esophagus. This is a great place to look. And with that, I'll thank everybody for their attention. And we'll see you next time. Have a great day, everybody.